Hey, everybody, welcome back to Pro AV today. Today is a, really a conversation I've been looking forward to having for a while. Uh, you know, we keep hearing this phrase AV as a service, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different folks. Everybody's got questions. Who's doing it well? Who's not doing it well? Uh, so I, I want to do my best today to really help represent a lot of those questions and ask uh, our next guest, really those questions to help get some insight. And uh, I teased our guest already in the intro two seconds ago, but uh, we've got a fantastic uh, guest on the show today, uh, and that's Phil Langley over at Wesco. They're doing some incredible work with the as-a-service model, and I uh, wanted to pick his brain today. Phil, thanks so much for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to be here, mate. Well, Phil, you and I had a chance to actually meet on stage uh, out at Infocom and, and have a similar conversation, a little bit more geared towards kind of the hardware manufacturer side of the world. And you know, today I wanted to even dig in a little bit deeper with you because even since we've been at the show, there's been a lot of evolution from the as a service side. And a lot of folks are thinking that means software. A lot of folks think that means gear rental. Some folks are trying to figure out what the support model looks like. And I think there's just a lot of confusion in the industry. So really to set the table for our conversation today, I wanted to kind of ask, you know, what are some of the things that are driving the as a service model uh, in the pro AV spectrum? It's the end user that's driving it. Uh, and I think they've been on it for a long time. You know, the office of the CIO is now the the uh, the owner of uh, of UCC Pro AV, where, you know, traditionally it would have been the facilities group. So they're kind of used to buying or consuming as a service as it is. Um, that, that thing you said too, Ben, I think all those things are right. It's like uh, I, I often think about telepresence. What did that what did that end up meaning? It meant lots of different things. And, you know, uh, Delivering a service or as a service can mean lots of different things. But in terms of the driving, and it's, it's the customer that really wants um, to consume in that way or, or has OPEX budget and uh, is used to consuming in that manner and that we are now able in our industry to provide a UCC outcome as a service for them. You know, you talked about the end users kind of specifically having a desire to uh, you know, have a little bit more subscription models, always have kind of the, the, the latest and greatest you know, as we've expanded into a lot of different verticals and industries, whether it's UCC, whether it's more into education, whether it's into hospitality, different places like that, those those end users and those buying channels uh, look a little bit different maybe than the traditional pro EV side of the world. How have you seen some of those buyers and end users drive some of those changes specifically? One of the one things that stuck out to me the most is when I had a conversation with a CIO that had been handed um, 6,000 rooms globally. And he didn't know what he had um, in situ. He wanted to be able to understand what he had. He also said, I have OPEX budget. I'd like to be able to spend that. In the past, it's been very difficult for me to be able to consume UCC as a service. I've got, you know, again, I have OPEX budget. And, I, you know, I've got laptops that I, that I uh, consume as a service. I have network that I consume as a service. I have software. Why can't I do UCC? And I think it's... We've, our, our Pro AV channel has been working with end users for, for many, many years. And the question is coming to them now saying, look, I want to be able to consume this as a service. I've got pressure to hit budgets. Um, I don't want this. I don't. I want the UCC outcome. I don't necessarily want the technology on my balance sheet. Can you help me out? And in the past, because we are a very creative industry and that was what attracted me and a lot of the people in the industry to come into it, technology is now commoditized uh, in a good way in such that where we used to have a 12 hour U rack in a space, we can do it with some, you know, a soft client and a sound bar and some connectivity for want of a better word um, and some glass. And then we can multiply that by, um, by thousands now. So I think, I think that's probably the challenge. I think, I think you'd have to ask the integrators themselves, but from my position from where we look in, it's really the demand to be able to, you know, hit budgets, consume as a service and fit in line with how IT like to buy. Well, we talked a lot kind of about some of the ways that, that Wesco and the Annexer team were, were doing that through what's called kind of conference room as a service, right? Like you, like you mentioned, uh, what are some of the ways that, that, you know, that process has, has evolved for, for you all on the Wesco side, you know, what does that look like? How does your normal manufacturing, you know, kind of buying process look versus the installation integration and support? How does that look for you? That's a good question. So I think the one thing to talk about is it's now, and we've touched on it, it is now possible to do that. Um, you know, scale, we've got low complexity solutions in large volumes over large geographic areas. The way we buy the hardware really hasn't changed. I think 
it's the service that's first and the, the technology is second. So if you think about the customer with, is the service and then we roll the technology into that to provide that outcome. So I think it's really, we've produced a, um, an engine, a billing engine and um, a platform to allow us to build all over the world um, with the technology that now lends itself to having um, third party help desks support a product like that. So really it's not, you know, my job is to steer Wesco Annexter at a, at a pivoting Pro AV UCC space or changing Pro AV UCC space. It's really coming at us at a rate of knots. And I think for all those things, just as just as readily, so the gap's closing. So the reason I say that is because we have, we're not really changing how we've, we've done business. It's now that, that the same customer wants to be able to procure their UCC and AV the same way they've been procuring other technologies from, from, uh, from Wesco through our channel for many, many years. Well, you, you brought up and you said just something really interesting, and I, I kind of like it. It's the first time I've heard it framed that way, where the service is first and the technology is second. Can you dig in a little bit deeper on there, when you, especially on that service side? What sort of services are you seeing demand for on the, uh, in the channel? Well, let me say it by this way. We're a very, um, very product-focused uh, industry in Pro AV and UCC, where we would, we would go to a customer, they would ask for an outcome, and we would, we would get disparate uh, equipment, pull it together, design a solution, and then we would move on to the next. Um, really now, um, it lends itself to, to it's a le lot less complex. Now, remember, I'm looking through a lens into the corporate environment, into that office space that you spoke about or the, or the, or the, um, the conference room as a service we spoke about, though it does lend itself to other areas. I think the key is, um, you know, they don't have a problem in the selection of the technology now because the manufacturers do a great job of getting in front of them. Where they have a problem now is how am I going to deploy this over large geographic areas? What's my user experience going to be like in my offices? I want the same experience all over the world. And then I want to be able to make sure I've got an uptime of 99.9% .9 on SLA. Um, is, do I need the technology to do that? Or am I interested in, um, in the hardware? Am I interested in the outcome? And I think when we first met Ben, I spoke about the building site that has the compressor. Uh, and because uh, he needs compressed air to build his 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 um build the the project or build the house for his for the nail gun does he does he really want the capital expense of the compressor or does he just really need the compressed air and if there's a service say well I can give you the compressed air don't let me worry about the hardware um that's really attractive to to that buyer so I think um that's the service if you think about that as the service and then what do you need what technology do you need around that service to be able to uh, deliver that outcome? So it's a different way of thinking. Well, it, it absolutely is. And to go back really to one of your first points, you talked about the familiarity with the end, use, end users in that world, right? My, my CRM that I use is uh, subscription-based, right? A lot of the tools and platforms that I use are subscription-based. And I think for a long time, because we've actually considered the technology that we have maybe as a capital expense or, or, or something to, that kind of is on the budget, we haven't really seen that that world as uh, a subscription model, right? And, and transparently, a lot of that has become is because the revenue side on on an upfront payment is pretty good, right? And and that brings up really one of the things that, that I wanted to ask about too is, you know, from the revenue side of things, a, a lot of things can get very confusing because you look at the traditional Pro AV channel, uh, it's largely upfront payment hard gear cost, and then maybe we're going to tack on some support in the long term, right? But when you look at more of a, an AV as a service type model, you know, when we look at subscriptions, that cost tends to want to even out, right? What are some of the ways that you've seen, uh, you know, end users or decision makers want to try and pay for some of these services? And how does that go in the face of maybe kind of the lump sum up front? Yeah, look, again, that's probably one for the integrator more than it is us. But I can tell you the service that we offer um, is is um, um, we we funded ourselves like we spoke before I think about the fair market value leasing the FMV leasing and it becomes a capex sale to an integrator anyway um, because they're backing it out and to a third party integrator um, sorry to a third party funder and that funder bills the end user and that's considered a service as well whereas we see. You know, a lot of a lot of the big end of town don't like the issue of having that that debt sold to a third party. They see it as a problem. So, we're we're a large you know Fortune 500 organisation that's in the, has the ability to fund these things. So we provide uh, the funding 
um, uh, to back these services up directly. Um, if that's does that answer your question? Or is no, that it, a- it it does, and and it's it's kind of an interesting area, right? Because there are there are a lot of different financial models in the industry, right? And, and some people that have found their way into pro AV, maybe from more consumer technologies, uh, are very familiar with the, whether it's the subscription, whether it's the pay as you go model, but, but historically in the B2B side of pro AV, we, we haven't yeah. done, we haven't, we haven't really evolved with the times. Right. And I think that's why we're seeing such a, uh, kind of a, a clunk, a clunky, you know, trying to walk uh, and figure uh, out the, you think about it. You th- you've got a situation where you've instead of just having a sale value, you've got a sale and revenue value now. So the total sale value could be over a three-year period, but what do you revenue in that period? Does your customer want to be billed monthly or do they want to be billed yearly? Um, uh, SaaS is a, is a is a is a is a probably a little bit e- easier because you can deliver that uh, a software. You spoke about your CRM. You can do that from anywhere in the world. If you introduce hardware into the mix, you need logistics global logistics and supply chain to back that up. So, and the, t- the, the product title doesn't, doesn't move to your customer. The title stays with you. So it's a means to that end. So yeah, how do you pay your, how do you pay your, your, your salespeople? Do you pay them on the revenue amount? Do you pay them on the sale amount? Um, you know, there's all sorts of different, um, it, 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 that's why it's a tough leap, right? And I think the, it, what, what, as we evolve as an industry, I think we spoke before about the barriers to entry lowering, and we've got other uh, IT and data comm type businesses that are entering this space that are very used to doing things as a service. So as an industry, as a private industry, we really have to gear ourselves up to be able to, to, be able to accept this and have a, a business model that works with with um, with OPEX style um, or at least consumption-based models. And that's, this is why we developed this program, to help people move into that space and, and have the tools available to, to, for large organizations to say yes more often because that, you know, it's the, it, we provide everything in the service as opposed to a, a third party funder. Well, and I want to ask too, just, you know, if you could put your manufacturer hat on for a second, how does that, uh, how does that change or, or evolve the, what, not only the product design process, but how manufacturers typically will work with integrators, installers, or, or kind of distributors? How does, that, how does that change the product design process? Are they design, designing for a longer product life cycle, or are they content with saying, hey, technology is going to continue to advance? Maybe we look at a one to two year product life cycle instead of maybe a three to five. You know, that came up recently. Uh, it's, I hadn't actually thought about it before. I, I, my sense about it, Ben, is that technology is got to us, you know, manufacturers are developing technologies for the available um, uh, solutions that are out there, right, the available technology that's out there, um, and they're doing it um, to suit uh, a particular mode. So, for example, with Zoom and Teams, they're soft clients. Remember the days of hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of Cisco on-prem infrastructure? Well, you know, we've gone to the cloud and we can do things much more inexpensive now um, in terms of delivering a UCC outcome. So, they're so um, it's a chicken or the egg thing for me. I think that we've got ourselves into a situation where we can service globally pro AV or UCC technologies at volume because they're a lot more simple. They're not they're standards based as opposed to creative. Remember creativity. Ask any chef in a restaurant. It's very hard to scale creativity. McDonald's doesn't scale um, food. They scale a process, right? So it's the process, I think, we are now in a position because of manufacturers have delivered a built technology to allow it this more simplified and to allow it to scale. It's an interesting question whether they did that deliberately. I'm not sure that's the case. And um, I think they did, they developed the, the solution um, based on, you know, the available technologies. And it just happens to be now a lot more simple to develop some of these smaller spaces at volume because of that technology. Well, and Phil, you bring up kind of the global reach of the AV community and, and uh, one of the hard parts about uh, a lot of our community is that we do tend to centralize in, in the United States. We do have shows like ISE and things like that. You know, are, are a lot of folks in other countries and regions having similar conversations? Do you see AV as a service scaling even beyond just traditional core North American pro AV? Yeah, well, I've got to tell you, um, it's, in fact, it's the complete opposite. I, you can tell by my silly accent, I've, I'm not from the US. And though I live in Texas today and we have been for, for eight years now, um, before I left Australia, I worked for a business called Tel- Telstra, which is a large telco. And we had developed a um, an as-a-service 
uh, solution for a large, one of the, the big four banks in Australia. That, that was over 10 years ago. And they were consuming Cisco product as a service and on a three-year 99.8% um, uptime SLA, I amortised over the um, size of the business. I th and I was quite surprised that, that the US hadn't jumped on that. Europe's very strong. Asia's very strong. And I think it was the cost of capital, um, you know, when I first got to the States, it was money was almost free. It's not such the case now. So I think it's been a it's like most things, there's multiple points um, to a change or a shift. Technology has allowed itself to, to, to be scaled more broadly, to be standards, more standard as opposed to creative um, for scale. Cost of capital is a lot more expensive um, than it's ever been. And, you know, I don't think it'll go back down to the, you know, ones and twos and zeros that it was. And, um, and the office of the CIO is now the customer. So they kind of, oh, he, she, he or she are used to consuming that way. So um, I think if anything, even though the US is the biggest market, it's been a laggard in the consumption of UCC as a service. Well, and I want to kind of land the plane with this and, and kind of give you the last word here. Um, I, I really enjoyed actually that you kind of mentioned it, right? You talk about whether it's financing dollars being cheaper here in the States and you seeing a lot of these technologies evolve uh, globally as well. You know, the future of AV as a service looks different to different folks, right? And that's something we touched on at the beginning. But in your opinion, you know, where do you see this evolution going, right? Do you see it impacting, you know, not only traditional pro AV clients and, and, and enterprise organizations? What are some of the ways that you see uh, AV as a service continuing to evolve over the next five, 10 years? Well, that's that's a great question. Um, I think that'll be led by multiple factors. One is which is the manufacturers, right? What, 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 how easy is it going to be to deploy these um, this technology um, in the future? I, I uh, and, and and I think it more broadly to your question, you know, we, we'll be consuming technologies uh, as a service for everything. I mean, digital ceiling, um, security as a service. Um, uh, access control as a service, everything as a service. You know, I, I where will Pro AV evolve to? I, I you know, it's a great. It'll be every, it'll be pervasive. I think the the, the thing to note is, and and, I, and there'll be people listening to this that say, well, look, look right now we've got thirty percent occupancy in some of these buildings, right? What's going to happen? And if you talk to JLL and some of those other commercial real estate people, they speak about the home, the office, and the third place, which might be a regional office for people. Um, hybrids here to stay. So I think that we'll start to see this in the home. And we are, we've been working for some, with some very large end users where um, it's it's seen as, it's, it's transparent. No matter where you are, it's seen as transparent. So it's um, um, it's consuming, they're, they're, we've got one customer we're working with via our channel where they're, they're VP and above, they have, they're, they're putting, um, UCC solutions in their in their home offices, and it's all part of the one big happy family, and they're consuming that. So it doesn't really matter where you are. So I think we'll see it come into the home. I think we'll see it come into that third place, which is a regional office. Um, and and I know that it's it underpins the hybrid. You know, whatever happens, it underpins the hybrid working environment. So um, I think we'll see everywhere people work, we'll start to see this. Well, Phil, I can tell you, if uh, if any of the folks from Cedia are listening to this, they're chomping at the bit right now to uh, to ask you some more questions because I I tend to agree. I think I think you'll start to see a lot more of these in homes, in places like security and access control, even in higher ed to a larger extent, right? And and as our community continues to expand, we reach different decision makers, different disciplines, different applications. Uh, we're going to continue to absorb some of those ideas and there's going to be some natural process and challenge and change, which you, we're, we're seeing right now in AV as a service, right? It's it's clunky, like I said, at best for most people, but uh, you guys are doing a fantastic job of it, which is why I wanted to bring you on today. And, and I appreciate uh, you having some candor and really good, digging deep with us and, and chatting about it. So Phil, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thanks, Ben. And thank you for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe and watch next time.